Very welcome to the sixth webinar of the Kratos project. And today's seminar is going to be on towards human-like sense of touch by means of neuromorphic approach. I will give you a short introduction about the topic and we'll introduce our eminent speakers today. We will have two speakers. Um, then we will have a 20 minutes approximately session for the speakers to talk about the topic. And then we will have approximately 10 minutes for Q&A. So the speakers will start with their presentation and then I will facilitate the discussion over the talk. So regarding the neuromorphic approach for human-like sensation in touch, um, we would like to see why this is important because when it comes to conventional electronic skin, um, a large area electronic device for sensing tactile events uh, may comprise of sensor array which analog signal is read out by serially sampling individual sensors in the array. The rate of frame-based data are usually utilized by machine learning based on artificial neural networks or artificial sense of touch. And for example, you can consider object classification by touching and grasping. The conventional electronic skin, aforementioned, has poor energy efficiency that prevents from upscalability. And it and is ill suited for taking advantage of dynamic tactile information required for rapid tactile feedback. In this talk, design and development of new e skins for energy efficient dynamic tactile feedback will be presented. So um, we use neuromorphic approach uh, based on neuroscientific theory uh, to create building blocks for artificial tactile sensory systems. Mixed uh, hardware and software implementation will be used to create event-driven neuromorphic tactile systems that could efficiently code dynamic tactile information for rapid object classification and spatial resolution uh, in response to touching and grasping. So that's a, that's a short background about today's seminar. So let me introduce the speakers. So we have two eminent speakers, as I said, starting with Dr. James Goodman. So Dr. James, Goodman is a postdoctoral research scientist in neurobiology at the German Private Center, DPC, in Göttingen, Germany. James earned joint bachelor's and master's degrees in biomedical engineering from Drexel University in 2013, where his studies concentrated on neuroengineering, where he conducted research with Dr. Karen Moxon into the use of spinal cord stimulation to restore movement in a rodent model of spinal cord injury. Jameson earned his PhD in 2018 from the University of Chicago, where he worked with Dr. Sliman Bensmeyer, applying machine learning to in vivo primate electrophysiology data to elucidate the specialized computations and neural dynamics supporting proprioception of the hand. He then joined Neurobiology Lab in 2019, where he continues to blend machine learning and in vivo electrophysiology to study the influence of sensory information on the cortical circuits which control movements in primates. In particular, his research focuses on how cortical responses to tactile feedback and the observation of others performing actions might be leveraged to improve the performance of brain computer interface technologies. Dr. Goodman, I would leave the floor to you for your presentation. You're most welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just begin to share my screen very quickly. Da -da -da -da. And I believe those should be my slides. Um, okay. Uh, well, thank you for, very much for the very uh, thorough introduction, Robin. Uh, uh, so today I'm going to open up this webinar by talking a little bit about the a few of the potential applications and the impact that an artificial touch system, broadly speaking, can have. Uh, to motivate a bit the technological advances in this domain that B. Kratos is push pushing forward, uh, which Jibin will talk about after I do. So to start, let me tell you just broadly speaking what the core mission of the B. Kratos project is. In short, it's to develop the sort of closed loop neuroprosthetic system outlined and illustrated uh, in Pandraneth and Bensmeya 2021, wherein neural signals are read out from the brain, then decoded to generate movements of some end effector, in this case, a robotic hand, all while sensors 
detect contact events on the hand, and an encoder converts those sensor signals to stimulation to feed haptic information back to the brain. A number of massive engineering challenges are, need to be solved for such a system, not only in terms of sophisticated neural interfaces and end effectors, but also in terms of the uh, hidden challenges related to powering such a system and sending wireless signals through tissue to get them where they need to be. All of these technical challenges are being addressed by different modules being worked on by the B. Kratos project. But today I want to zoom in on this sensory feedback part of the loop, uh, explain why it's such a critical need for BCI applications, and then bring up some of the broader applications of advancing artificial touch beyond a closed loop BCI per se, and perhaps even beyond using direct brain stimulation to provide that tactile feedback. Thereafter, Jibin will focus a little bit more on the sensor technology per se, which should enable this sensory feedback module. So just to begin to motivate things, why should we focus on restoring touch to begin with? We could generate a system that reads out neural signals, generates fluid movements, and then have that uh, uh, be the entirety of our system. Uh, well, there are a couple of reasons. The more subjective and more difficult to measure of these is simply that experiencing touch can be pleasant and enriching. It enables the feeling of a warm embrace or a soft texture, the same way vision affords appreciation of paintings and hearing the appreciation of music. However, the more objective and measurable measure uh, is that motor performance actually degrades in the absence of somatosensory feedback. Uh, here I have two demonstrations of this effect. One in a well-controlled scientific setting where an otherwise typically healthy woman's fingertips have been numbed. Uh, she has otherwise no motor deficits and a completely intact visual system to guide her movements. Um, and she is tasked with uh, striking a match. And it's going to be a little bit awkward to watch. It's a favorite demonstration tool of uh, my advisor in the past anyway. But you'll watch her attempt to strike the match. She'll completely struggle to grasp onto a match, drop the first one, try with a second one, struggle mightily to get it in position, try to strike it, struggle to move it across the top of the box. And there we are. Finally manages to do it after maybe 30 seconds or so. Uh, and then I have another demonstration in a more goofy virtual reality setting where numerous factors outside the lack of somatosensory feedback uh, could be hindering the performance of a simple task, although the lack of sensory feedback is certainly not helping. So here we have somebody who's tasked with uh, you know, moving a ring from one side of this manipulandum to the other. And we can see for the larger ring, uh, they're able to use hand tracking in this case to grasp onto it in virtual reality and move it to the other side. But now you see they've started to try and grasp at the smaller ring and a combination of uh, maybe hand tracking, that's about 80% there. And see, he has to use both hands even. Um, and a lack of sensory feedback is contributing to a very awkward ability to manipulate these rings in this setup. And he's finally able to do it, but it takes quite a while to do what we might otherwise think should take 10 seconds. And although it's cute and silly to experience this clumsiness when it's on a temporary basis, if this were a more permanent situation, your hands would probably be pretty aggravating to use. So that's sort of setting the stage for why we care about this. And in terms of the core mission of B. Kratos, uh, where you're talking about a closed-loop brain-computer interface, um, research has been done in, in human subjects anyway that shows that if you do provide specifically somatosensory feedback about these movements, uh, while subjects are tasked with you know, moving objects from one side of a field to the other or otherwise performing a set of standard uh, therapeutic tasks called uh, which are collected under the ARATs, um, subjects uh, exhibit a performance benefits to having essentially stimulation feedback turned on 
with respect to when they use a more simple system where you don't have somatosensory feedback, you basically turn off an array which was implanted in somatosensory cortex and simply do not allow the, the input of somatosensory input back to the subject, right? Um, that said, uh, this demonstration uh, is, uh, while impressive, is still a little bit limited, right? The sensors available to the system were limited to torque sensors in the joints of the robotic limb being used in this particular study. And further gains may yet be achievable with a more sophisticated sensor array and perhaps a more biomimetic mapping between tactile and cortical stimulation events. In addition to this intended use case of B. Kratos, I'm sort of expanding a little bit uh, and looking into other potential applications of the sensor technology and of feedback per se, uh, not necessarily through cortical means. And one way this might be achieved would be in the application of medical robotics, where the uh, influx of haptic information to operators of something like a da Vinci robot uh, has been shown, at least in small scale uh, academic settings, to offer performance benefits in terms of lower grip forces and uh, more accurate detection of, for example, blood vessels in tissue phantoms. Right. Um, however, again, so far, the feedback mechanisms have still been relatively crude and rely primarily on feedback from a relatively small number of sensors on a rigid robotic actuator. That being said, the robotic actuators are generally fairly small, um, but being able to optimize that further might further improve the use of this technology. And finally, this use case might be a little bit more spe speculative, a good deal more speculative after all, but there's a chance to augment improvements to, uh, for example, stroke rehabilitation via uh, the improvement of tactile feedback uh, interventions. Um, now, what's less speculative than you might expect is that uh, virtual reality and gaming-based rehabilitation interventions in, in stroke are actually uh, associated, uh, according to a longitudinal study, with a good improvement in terms of functional outcomes, right? A significant improvement, rather. And <clears throat> however, these are primarily, these sort of, we have a good deal of data on this because this trend sort of took off uh, at the beginning of last decade, a little bit earlier even when the Wii was released, if anyone can remember that. Um, but we've collected a bunch of data since then. Uh, these interventions seem to offer better than usual outcomes in terms of uh, rehabilitation outcomes as measured by functional motor uh, scores, such as the ARAT or the Fugelmeier. Um, but of course, uh, as this is a hot topic, tactile feedback has been attempted thus far. Um, and this is why I say this is a speculative note uh, because the jury is out, still out on its effectiveness, in part because there's a lot of different ways that stroke can manifest. There's a lot of different uh, brain areas that stroke can affect. And naturally, there is a difference between strokes that affect the somatosensory uh, systems and those that do not. Hence, the different outcomes that might be seen if you add, if you enhance sensory feedback by adding a somatosensory modality to a VR experience as opposed to one that's primarily based on visual cues. Um, but in any case, it's, although speculative, it's a, a path forward for enhancing technology related to uh, sensors and feedback actuators that might be, uh, that for, for example, might be worn by a subject. Uh, basically another path forward that B. Kratos might be able to uh, leverage technological advances uh, to help uh, people. <laughs> so now that we've talked about some of the benefits of a feedback path per se, let's get into what B. Kratos is developing to address a need at the tactile sensing portion of this loop. And just to very briefly introduce it, um, the novel sensory sensor technology that Jibin will talk about in a lot more detail later has offers a couple of very distinct advantages. 
It allows for a very high resolution uh, sensor sheet for uh, very fine grained tactile information. Um, it's, it's based on triple electric nano generators, a very big word that Jibin will explain in more detail, but it's kind of like static electricity. Um, but in addition to allowing for high spatial resolution, it also can be embedded with a, within a soft skin-like material for high biomimicry. And it's also extremely low power consumption, as Robin said in the introduction, one of the main points, uh, as the transduced signal is generated directly through contact via static electricity. And from here, I'll hand it off to Jibin to talk in more detail about that and perhaps uh, offer some more details about what he's been doing and to develop this technology, uh, which is a fully sensorized e-skin. And I, I, I'm done. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, James. And um, is there any questions for James from the presentation so far? Yeah, by the way, it was very engaging to see um, the goal trying to pick up a math stick and try to yeah strike it across the math box and and finally she succeeded despite her her fingers were numb was was it like you know uh, through drugs that it became numb or uh yes this was uh, temporary numbness with through i believe lidocaine but it's it's a relatively old study and it's been a while since i've looked at the details so right okay thank you james I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Robin Agustin. I'm the coordinator of the VCRAFTERS project. So if you were wondering who I am. Um, and I'm here in Upsala University, Associate Professor. Um, so my, my task is to connect between the brain and the artificial skin that uh, Zipin is working on. And James is part of the whole demonstrator where everything is going to be integrated onto a monkey and the monkey is going to do yeah, the stuff. Right, so let me, uh, without further ado, introduce uh, Dr. Zubin Sang, who is Associate Professor uh, and the Group Leader of Flexible Electronics and Neuromorphic Engineering at Uppsala University, and he's a good colleague of mine at the Department of Electrical Engineering since 2011. He obtained his Bachelor and Master degrees in Physics at Lanzhou University in 1993 and 1997, respectively. He received his PhD degree from Shanghai Institute of Applied Physics Chinese Academy of Sciences in 2001. He worked as a postdoctor from 2002 for two years and then as a researcher for six years at the Royal Institute of Technology or KTH in Sweden. Uh, he has published around 110 peer reviewed journal articles with an H index of 26. Uh, his research spans from nanomaterials, including carbon nanotubes and graphene, printer electronic components, energy devices, electronic skin neuromorphic circuit and neuromimetics systems. So Zibin, you're most welcome to continue the discussion. Thank you, Robin, for your nice introduction. And uh, thank you, James, for your very uh, nice introduction about uh, the, uh, now how important it is for uh, the tactile feedback created by electron skin. Okay, and then I try to share my screen. Okay, so um, now in the in this talk, basically, uh, I would like rather to uh, focus on some basic ideas and the concept on how to approach uh, the human access touch, rather than presenting you know, very uh, broadly the technical content. We know that the sense of touch actually is rather uh, complicated and advanced uh, you know, uh, cognitive process happening in our brain. And uh, actually, human like self touch is uh, very important for like precise uh, control of a prosthetic and the robotic hands as, uh, as James introduced. And uh, human like self touch actually is a kind of an ultimate goal when we try to develop electron skin. So, uh, so in this webinar, basically, I'm um, now I will start with some introduction. Uh, most of the 
co uh, content has been covered by James, but I will give some more uh, information. And then I come to the uh, uh, review of the existing textile sensors and the electron skin technology, and I give some uh, uh, limitations about the you know, existing technology uh, in when we try to drive for you know, human sense of touch. Okay, and then I come to uh, what we can learn from the tactile nervous system and some get some use of knowledge when we come to uh, design the electron skin from the component level to the circuit level. So this come to, this is the point three and four. And then point five, I will give some uh, you know, examples, uh, which is uh, demonstrations developed in our lab to show the advantages when we take uh, neuromorphic design. All right, and then I end up with a uh, summary. And my group currently focus on the technology for the flexible electronics and the neuromorphic engineering. Basically, we uh, focus on you know sensors development, uh, focus on you know, uh, the uh, step power event driven sensing, and we also try to use the devices for energy harvesting. So, so we can harvest the, the energy from the surrounding to get the electricity to, to power the uh, electronic components in the circuits. And with the sensors, basically, we can create the data, and then we can try to. In order to make use of data, we then we need to uh, develop the neuromorphic circuits uh, to implement the local uh, signal processing. And basically, in this part, we try to develop artificial sensory neurons and the synapses in using a hardware implement of electronic components. And then with that, then we are able to build up uh, systems which is uh, represent the networks, and then we can study network dynamics in order to understand the com cognitive computing uh, in the uh, hardware. Okay, so uh, basically in Big Quartos, we see that Big Quartos is a consortium project which has a very ambitious uh, 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 goal you know, uh, for the BCI technology. And in this project, basically, we are not responsible for this state of the uh, art of electron skiing. And uh, James already have a talk about this. And basically, our uh, base uh, the aim is to uh, uh, develop some breakthrough uh, to allow us to you know to get uh, one and one more step towards the human lack of sense touch. So we basically would like to focus on this uh, the fecal merit in terms of power efficiency, sensitivity, high resolution, and then, then we have want to make the ears of skin to be uh, able to uh, you know, learn it by touching and grasping. Okay. And of course, we have a strong collaboration with the other partners in the system integration. Uh, sorry. Okay. So James has uh, introduced very nicely about the uh, motivation uh, about the tech feedback. And actually, there are some more information, which is the uh no concerning the phantom limb pain because uh, for the patients who lost their the uh, part of the body for instance they are uh, for instance, they have uh, got the amputation and then they will feel pain this but the such sensation pain will stay for a very very long time and uh, and the people found that actually uh, if you stimulate the remaining uh, peripheral nerve, nerve fibers can somehow can elevate the such uh, phantom limb pain. So, so it's possible for us to you know, to exploit the tactile feedback to create an electrical stimulation. So, in one way, we can elevate the phantom limb pain. At the same time, we can you know, make the patient to have uh, some sort of uh, perception of the uh, protected uh, limbs they use, so they can make a make the patient to feel more comfortable with the perfect hand on their body. At the same time, we know that you know, you can uh, the tactile feedback, uh, particularly when we you know, achieve the human like self touch and then you can substantially increase the controllability of the uh, patients over the protected hands when, and then allow the, uh, them to uh, manipulate the object you know, as textually as a natural hand. And uh, 
And uh, James also you know, said that if you do not have a tactile feedback, basically, if you got the uh, numb on the hand, basically, it's a will know for the patient to feel very awkward to you know to um to to do things. And actually, uh, you can do some simple experiments. You know, you just put on a, a thick glove and try to uh, you know, for instance, you tie a uh, shoelaces you feel it's very hard to do so because i did it myself i found that it's impossible to to tie the <laughs> shoe uh, laces and at the same time it's uh, the same thing for the uh, robots you now if we uh, provide robots with uh, the possibility of a tactile feedback you know or, or uh, even like a self touch then basically we are uh, it's possible for us to make a robot to uh to handle objects uh as you know textually as a human's hand uh, and uh, one more uh, important thing is is that uh, with tactile feedback then it's possible for the the robot you know to interact with the human being uh, safely uh, and this is an important thing so uh with tactile feedback then it's uh, possible to you know, increase dramatically the application scope of robots, for instance, to handle the challenges we face in in daycare and the home care. You no, know, when when it, in such cases, you no, know, the safety is uh, necessary. Okay, then what is the sense of touch? You now, basically, uh, from the perspective of neuroscience, you no, know, uh, sense of touch is the all the sensations we feel by touching uh, of hand uh, with the objects. So you get uh, the sense of uh, pressure, roughness, uh, stiffness, and you know, warm and cold and so on. And all of this information you know, allow us to uh, probe the property of the object, you know, uh, in addition to uh, visual feedback. And uh, it's also important to uh, for this, for the tactile feedback to the, to accurately control our motor system, so we can learn, we can practice, and get a new skill. So uh, when we do a physical training, and we when we come to the the process, uh, how the tactile sensation uh, is created in our human body, then basically we see that our you know, our skin covering the whole body are equipped with a very large number of tactile sensors. For instance, in high hand. So it's equipped with a high density, large number of uh, tactile sensors, which are called the receptors and the actually they are receptor endings of the peripheral neurons. Okay, and uh, and in our body, basically, you now uh, we create a large volume, uh, highly dynamic data anytime. Now, and all of data will send uh, to our brain over several several spots, they reach your spinal cord for uh, at the step and then go to the brainstem and then go to the thalamus before they end up at the sensory cortex. So you see that we have a large volume of data you know, you know, and then the pathway somehow is rather you know, complicated. And when we come to uh, the uh, operations in signal processing uh, for the formation of uh, tactile perception, basically we see that, uh, you know, our body, you know, got uh, stimulated by different, uh, different um, uh, objects. For instance, you get uh, they they basically can be expressed by the physical quantities, you know, and they these physical quantities will be uh, transduced to electrical uh, quantities. For instance, like voltage or current. This process is called the sensing, right? And uh, Actually, there are more uh, for the uh, tactile perception. Uh, the signals need to be encoded and decoded. So it is coding process, and then they will be transmitted over uh, uh, over different parts of our body. And then there, there are a lot of computation happening before the tactile sensors, no, before the, actually before the signals are delivered to the sensory cortex. And uh, if you look at the, the uh, research uh, in the literature about the electron scheme, basically we see that uh, there are a lot of uh, papers and you know, I've reported different kinds of transducers uh, because uh, one type of transducer uh, will convert one type of physical quantity, for instance, the force into the uh, voltage. 
Or another type of uh, transducer will convert the temperature into a essential quantity. And for one type of transducers, you also have many, many other uh, sub uh, types of transducers depending on the mechanism you employ. Okay, so there are a lot of uh, different kind of transducers you can find in the literature. Here, I introduce some basic, uh, very uh, commonly used transducers. Uh, one transducer, of course, is uh, called a resistive transducers, and uh, depending on material you use, it can be split into conductor or semiconductor, right? The, but the structure is the same. You have a conductor, for instance, is uh, connected with the two electrodes, and uh, you apply the voltage, so you have a current going through the conductor. When you are, uh, press this uh, sensor, the uh, geometry property, like uh, no, no, the 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 diameter or the uh, the area will be changed, so you could change the resistance, okay, and then you can read out the change um, in current, right? So you have uh, also semiconductor, which is the same in in a structure, and then when you get the you press in these uh, devices, then basically the trans the resistance will also get changed uh, due to you know the change in the resistivity of this uh, semiconductor, and the uh, also, you can uh, you know the contact uh, between the semiconductor and the electrodes also will get changed. Anyway, so you need to apply a uh, voltage. No, you need to have a current going through the uh, active material uh, all the time uh, in order to catch the stimulation. And another type of a uh, a transducer is uh, based on capacitance, right? So you, for instance, you have a array of the uh, conductors, you build up electric field over the insulator mater uh, material, and then, then you have a, a finger touching at some point because uh, the finger is kind of a uh, conductor. So the touching actually can interfere the electric field locally, and then you can create the change in the capacitance, all right? And the other uh, structure will be like uh, one insulator material sandwiched with the two uh, uh, ele uh, metal electrodes, for instance, and then you get touch, you change the distance between these two uh, insulator uh, conductor materials, and you change uh, the conduct uh, conductance. The, the key message here is that uh, in order to read out the change of a capacitance, you need to apply a uh, volt, uh, uh, external power, you know, like like uh, the technique of uh, impedance measurement. So you need to uh, apply the power all the time in order to read the change in capacitance, similar as you need to read out the change in the resistance in the resistive uh, transducer. Okay. But now, how to construct the electrical skin? The traditional way actually is that you you have a large number of uh, uh, sensors. It will place the, all the sensors in the mesh uh, structure. So in the same row of, or the same line of the sensors will share the same um, uh, wires, okay? And then you uh, use a switch circuit this switch circuit will sample uh, sensor one by one. When you complete the sampling of uh, all of the sensors, you get uh, a so-called tactile map, right? If you, uh, if you repeat the sampling, you get uh, a so-called tactile video, right? So, and then you can, of course, you can apply the traditional artificial neural net network like a deep learning to process uh, the tactile video. And then you can get the, like, uh, the, the outcome of the, uh, for instance, object classification, right? So in this uh, structure or this uh, method, basically you can use a large, uh, a lot of, uh, now, uh, library of uh, different tools in the conventional electronic circuits, and then you can use uh, the uh, the developed machine learning technique, and they can you know, run on the von Neumann computers. Basically, this is somehow more or less uh, mature techniques nowadays. But uh, there are a lot of challenges existing in the conventional electronic skin. One, is, uh, the first uh, challenge is uh, concerning the um, mechanical property, because electron skin basically 
is a large area electronic device. And uh, when you need to apply it to the, the hand or then this uh, inner skin should be uh, three dimensional com compliant to, to the, these complicated shapes of the surface. And uh, at some point they should be stretchable, okay? So for this purpose, actually, if you look at the, today's uh, uh, new reports and the literature, basically people put a lot of effort on developing uh, intrinsic uh, stretchable materials, you know, including semiconductor, conductor, dielectric, and then you try to develop stretchable devices like a transistor, you know, resistor or capacitor, and then you develop the very complicated pattern technique in order to create a, a transistor array or sensor array. Okay, and then you also look at the stretchable uh, circuits. No, they can they can be a digital circuit or analog circuits. Anyway, people really put a lot of effort in because this includes the materials, the processing, and fabrication, and the performance. So this is uh, basically the main major uh, research effort is about. But there are more challenges on this uh, tra traditional no, uh, electron scheme. Uh, one is uh, uh, the power consumption actually is an issue because you need to sample uh, sensors all the time. So it consumes power even though there's no stimulation. And uh, for real application, you need to in you need a large number of uh, sensors. Okay, when the the larger number of sensors you have, you the larger power consumption you will have. Actually, if you look at the real application. For human like self touch, the power consumption is is a big problem. So for this reason, actually the uh, upscaling is uh, difficult. And uh, if you want to try to reduce the power consumption, then you somehow you know uh, anal analog uh, electronics is a solution. But uh, for analog solution, analog signals basically it uh, tends to be interfered by. Now by uh, uh, noise and the different kind of variations. Okay, and then another challenge is that because the, now in the sensor structure, basically many sensors will share one you know, uh, uh, wires, and then then if there's any uh, damage to the wiring, basically you can damage the performance of the uh, sensor, so it has a poor robustness against the damage, right? And uh, finally, it's a uh, very difficult. I mean, it's quite kind of poor uh, performance in catching, uh, capturing dynamic information because you you need to in order to catch. Uh, Dynamic information you need to you know increase. You need a high speed uh, sampling rate, and then, then uh, if you look at the tactile uh, video, basically uh, people like to use, you know to make a, a time interval between frame to frame hundred milliseconds because this is the uh, time interval for our eyes to see a continuous uh, film. But in our uh, human body, now basically the temporal resolution is uh, much much higher. Now the time interval could be uh, down to 0.1 to 10 milliseconds. With this highest temporal resolution, it's uh, possible for us to to accurately, uh, precisely control uh, our motor system. So now the question is that uh, is how to create. Uh, new electron schemes that uh, have capability of uh, coding highly dynamic tactile information while it can consume uh, a little uh, amount of uh, uh, energy and uh, it can be also very robust to 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 uh, variation and and, uh, and um, damage okay and uh, as a one promising solution is uh, through this uh, new morphic approach and what is uh, neuromorphic engineering? Because if we come to the tactile uh, nervous system, as I said before, now our uh, tech, the tactile nervous system basically deal with the large volume, highly 
dynamic uh, complete data at the same time. Uh, it can, when all the uh, data was delivered, delivered to the uh, sensory cortex, basically you can create the cognitive uh, processes and we get the tactile perception. Okay, all of this um, uh, process actually consume very little amount of uh, energy because of our brain basically when it is in uh, intensive uh, um, tasks, the power consumption usually is like a 20 to 30 watt. You know, when you play game, uh, gaming on, on computer, for instance. So, um, so the neuromorphic engineering idea basically is to uh, tell us that uh, if we created electronic devices that can um, emulate the similar basic operations uh, the neurons have, and in principle, we can create a similar uh, behaviors and functions when we uh, create a system that have a similar uh, organizing structure as the, our nervous system has. And then, well, then let's look at the, the basic operation. The first operation our nervous system has is that, uh, for instance, if your uh, our uh, tactile sensor get stimulated by a by a pressure, for instance, now, now the pressure will basic will generate uh, the variation of uh, voltage, and then when the voltage uh, hit a threshold, it will sp uh, hit a spike, fire spike, right? So. If we just neglect the change in the voltage in, in a low level, basically we look at, the, we can regard the spike as an event without any feature, then we can assign a time point to this event. So, so somehow the, uh, the information of uh, you know, tactile stimulation will be um, expressed uh, in the form of a spike. No. And then when we look at uh, our skin, basically our skin hosts uh, different uh, types of uh, tactile sensors. Each type of sensors can uh, be different in the fe uh, response feature towards the tactile stimulation. For instance, our when our hand grip a uh, up an object, okay, and uh, hold it and uh, release it. During this procedure process, uh, different uh, receptors basically will provide different patterns you know, of a series of spikes. We call these spike trends. Some uh, receptors is uh, more sensitive to the to the uh, intrusion to face, like uh, onset of uh, stimulation or the uh, no, release of stimulation, and uh, the like. Another two type of uh, receptor, which are called uh, SA1, SA2, basically they also fire spike during the holding phase. So from here, basically we see that uh, the, a complicated tactile sti stimulation will be uh, encoded into a spike trains with different uh, patterns, you know, uh, generally, which are generated by the different uh, receptors. Okay, when we look at the, the um, Transmission, basically, you see that the, the, the peripheral neurons you now uh, we generate the spike trains uh, uh, at the place close to the sensors, and you also have a, a variation in the voltage, but only the spikes will be successfully you know, delivered to the to the end of the peripheral neurons, which is in the cortex. No, sorry, in the spinal cord, because of the fluctuation in the voltage will fade away during transmission because the this transmission length is long. And then you can see that uh, the, the signals will be transmitted over you know, several uh, synapses. Now, one synapsis is in a spinal cord, the other one will be in a you know, spring stem and the, and the thalam thalamus, uh, which connecting uh, the um, sensory cortex. Okay, and uh, so basically we can see that uh, the tactile nervous system somehow uh, is the uh, feed forward um, multiple no, uh, layers of a new network. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, one thing which 
it's interesting is that uh, actually it's particularly important for tactile nervous system. Uh, people found that it, it, in the spike trend uh, generated by different uh, neurons when they get the stimulation, then it is the first spike in each spike trend actually deliver, uh, carry the majority of the tactile information. So for instance, if we can use uh, a, a C, a group of uh, timing now uh, of the spikes, uh, and uh, we just reduce them to the first spikes. Basically, you have a uh, no, uh, first spike of, uh, of the timing of a first spike, and the uh, eye is spanned from over the all the neurons that are involved. And uh, the what you see here is that when the finger gets uh, stimulated with by touching some of some objects, then the first spike will be generated and the transmitted to the to the second uh, neuron when the spike first spike arrive at the same time basically then the second new second order neuron will fire spike so you get the the uh, transmission of a signal uh, and uh, this is uh, somehow you now uh, dominated by the first spike uh, in the neurons. And when you look at the neuron in the structure, basically you see that each neuron has a very complete and highly branched dendrite. And the function of dendrite basically is to uh, receive uh, information signals from many uh, synapses and integrate the signals. And the integrated signals will pass uh, to the so much, and uh, no, you then you can do, and it can do more uh, signal processing. But the uh, the message I would like to say is that uh, the dendrite, the functional dendrite, basically to implement the signal integration. And when come to uh, the encoding of a neuron, uh, okay, we see that the signals, which is in a variation in current over time, and it will be encoded into the spike train as we see before. And actually, you know, the neuron, we, when we try to emulate the function uh, operation of neuron, basically we can use a different kind of neural models, but uh, it's very complicated to, you know, to uh, uh, emulate the uh, behavior by, by calculating the, the, the models. But we can look at the, how the uh, neuron encode the tactile in, uh, signals. And we can roughly split the encoding mechanism into two parts. One is called so-called rate coding. The other one is timing coding. For rate coding, uh, basically people just uh, uh, calculate the number of the spikes in a specific time window. Then you can see uh, the get the time uh, the rate. But you also make the thing simpler, right? You can assume the uh, spikes appear uh, in a periodic you know, manner. So then you can use frequency, okay? And the higher frequency, you have a higher rate, basically. But uh, in a real neuron, you know, they will never uh, fire spike in a periodic uh, manner. <clears throat> Okay, so the second one, if you really think that uh, the timing is important, then you have to use a uh, timing coding. So the understanding of uh, coding uh, and it can somehow to guide us to uh, to 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 design the uh, uh, the circuit, electron circuit, using different components and. Uh, Another thing we also need to look at is the synapse because the synapse is uh, important for the neuromorphic computing. And uh, when we look at the uh, nervous system, basically the synapse, we see that there's a chemical synapse and the electrical synapse. The basic function uh, operation of synapse basically is that when you have a spike arrive at the pre neuron here, and then it will induce the a current pulse in the post synaptic neuron, and this this uh, uh, current pulse basically is uh, expressed by alpha, which is the maximum current induced by one uh, spike, and then it multiplied by weight. So 
this weight can be uh, changeable, okay? And uh, the, the changing of weight actually is uh, the process of learning called that. Okay, and then when we come to the um, uh, organizing system, uh, principle of our nervous system, one concept is so-called receptive field, okay? Because if you look at the peripheral neuron, each neuron actually uh, contains uh, a few uh, tactile sensors in the skin. So if we record one specific uh, peripheral neuron and you stimulate your skin uh, at a different positions, basically you can get the such curve no, which is a fine rate uh, as a function of the position on, of the stimulation on the skin. And then you can get the, uh, the range in this uh, D, which uh, generates the maximum fine rate. So the range of this uh, stimulation position is the receptive field of this particular neuron. All right. Okay, and then if you have uh, two neurons uh, which uh, sit together, basically they have a receptive field which is overlapped. Now, uh, so we, the final uh, organizing uh, uh, principle is a network type of uh, structure, which uh, we already seen that. So we have a review uh, a few uh, basic operation, including the uh, tran transduction, uh, of the tactile sensors and uh, how the neuron operate in in the signal coding, we we say that the frequency or spike timing, and the synapse operation and receptive field overlap overlapping receptive field and the spike neural network. Then let's uh, move to uh this our design uh, according to what do we learn from the neuron science? Okay, for the uh, sensing, what we we try to exploit one common uh, phenomenon, which is called the triboletric e effect, because for any two objects, any two materials get a physical contact, there will be an electrical transfer, electronic, ele electron transfer, right? So get the triboletric effect, basically almost, almost uh, um, each object will get the uh, surface charge. So for instance, we have an object you know, with uh, a, a, some uh, surface charge and we have a sensor, which is a uh, conductor uh, covered with uh, a uh, elastomer film. They are charged as well. So if we are, uh, move the object approach, approaching this uh, sensor, basically you will create a uh, potential in this uh, conductor. And then it's easy for us to calculate this uh, uh, open circuit potential. So you can you now from this Maxwell equations and then, then you can set some uh, reasonable boundary conditions and then we can end up and to uh, this uh, equation, uh, this uh, formula, basically, it tells us the relation between the uh, potential as a function of a, a D, which is the distance between the objects and the sensor surface, okay? And then you can make a plot. Basically, what you can see here is that uh, when this object is uh, close to the sensor surface sufficiently, you can get, uh, uh, the increase of in the triboelectric potential. So we have uh, actually a proximity effect. This means that uh, the sensor can get the response um, without the physical contact, but the, the object is sufficiently uh, close to the sensor surface. Now, we can uh, apply this uh, potential to the gate electrodes of a transistor. So this transistor actually is like a valve to control the the uh, cu uh, electrical current. So normally we can set the uh, transistor to be off. Basically, there's no current going through uh, the channel, which is between the source uh, drain and the source. Okay, when you have a potential up, up from the gate, basically, and they can uh, open up the channel you have you have a current going through so so this actually is a 
a good sensor in terms of uh, you no know, uh, event driven because only when you have a you no know, stimulation uh, of the, by touching the object to the sensor you get uh, you make it you now you make the transistor to open the channel and then consume power uh, so it consume power only when you have stimulation this is a uh, a, a event driven sensing and at the same time you no know, the the generation of this uh, voltage on the gate actually is induced by the the approaching of the object right so this is actually is a self power process and the self power and event driven sensing actually is beneficial to the uh, power efficiency all right and then we come to the encoding of tactile stimulation. Uh, basically, if we just look at the frequency coding, right, then we can utilize a circuit which is called ring oscillator to do this job. Uh, ring oscillator actually is the um, no, is the uh, no. You have uh, several transistors you just connect in a series, and with this uh, circuit, basically you can convert analog signal like a voltage into electrical pulses, like a voltage pulses. So a good thing uh, to, to convert the amplitude modulus signal into frequency is that the frequency actually is very robust uh, towards the, the, the different uh, variations. You know? So in this plot, actually, this is the uh, sense uh, uh, built in our devices based, based on the triple electric effect. And then we use a ring oscillator to encode the uh, signal. And then you can see that when the, uh, the uh, object approach to the sensor surface with, with represent the D, and they can create the change of frequency in from the ring oscillator. And, and you also, at the same time, you see the peak um, amplitude actually change with the D as well. And this is not uh, possible. Um, but of course, this is the uh, the simple operation we can have from from using ring oscillator. Okay. And uh, we also can use an uh, uh, <clears throat> amplifier to simply to implement the signal integration that emulate you now the, the function of the uh, dendrite in a neuron. So for instance, you have a, like a three ring oscillators and connected to one amplifier. And basically um, the out output from this amplifier, basically uh, you, know, you see that it comprises the, all of these uh, frequency component uh, that is uh, present in the uh, uh, individual uh, ring oscillator. So the uh, output, the frequency component in the output uh, actually is the summation of the uh, input you know, from this uh, three ring oscillator. So we can just implement the signal integration. Okay. And then we can uh, connect several uh, sensor to one ring oscillator. And then we can arrange the sensor in some you no know, in some shape. So in this way, we actually can create a re uh, receive field uh, of this particular uh, ring oscillator. And actually, you can see that with this receive field, basically it can distinguish the uh, direction uh, of this the stimulation of the artificial skin. For instance, you have a rod rolling across this step field and it can create a three spectrums when it go along the vertical and uh, no, horizontal direction. And if it go from this direction, you get the two um, spectrums. Basically, so you can generate different pattern when this uh, stimulation is moving along different direction. Of course, it is can distinguish the speed as well because of the high speed you will get a shorter time interval between two uh, uh, spectrums. Okay, so then we have uh, 
trouble your sensors, we have a ring oscillator for frequency coding, and then we also can implement the, uh, uh, no, exploit the reserve field, then we can uh, somehow can construct a more complicated system. Like in this example, we uh, we have a, like a 54 tactile sensors, and then all of the tactile sensors are connected to nine ring oscillators. Okay, so for each uh, ring oscillator, there are five uh, sensors connected to it. Then we can define the subfields, uh, which is represented by different color. And somehow we can have a overlapping receptor field uh, between the, this, the adjacent receptor fields. All right. So, and then we can look at the uh, outcome, uh, output uh, at the synapse structures. So basically we see that uh, when we have a stimulation in a, no, in a small area, which actually is the down limit, you know, the conventional tactile uh, e-skin can dis uh, discriminate. And the, at the out, uh, output, basically, you can see that, that we have uh, really three uh, frequency components present in the same areas. So this means we have uh, we successfully you know, delivered the stimulation in, in terms of frequency at the output. And this whole system actually is event driven because the when there's no stimulation, it it costs very small amount of energy. You now the power consumption for this type of uh, ring oscillator, for instance, it consumes only fifteen nanowatt when there's no stimulation. But when you have a stimulation, basically, it can consume a higher power uh, power. So. <clears throat> And then what, there is, a, of course, there is a limitation when we use a ring oscillator to emulate the operation of a neuron because uh, the frequency is high because you, as you see that if we use the conventional component to build up a ring oscillator, usually the frequency can go to uh, tens or hundred kilohertz. Now, and uh, the higher frequency means a higher power consumption. And if we look at our nervous system, basically the 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 firing rate is up to two hundred hertz. Now, so if we use a ring also, basically the the frequency is unnecessarily high, and and to reduce the frequency, if you look at the literature, a lot of research group actually try to uh, develop a so called a low frequency ring oscillator using organic materials. Uh, to emulate the uh, low frequency behavior of uh, uh, of uh, neurons, of course, if we use a frequency, then basically uh, we do not care about the individual spikes, no, because then the uh, timing of individual spikes uh, has, has is not not important. But uh, as I said before, you know, for a real neuron, the spike timing actually is important, particularly for the first spike, right? And so in our lab, basically, we also tried to um, design the uh, analog circuit uh, to to uh, emulate the the uh, behavior of neuron, and then we can use the simple uh, version of the neuron model, which is called the leaky integral and fire model. And basically, in this uh, uh, circuit, you have a uh, three function uh, areas. One is you now for the integration integration of a signal, like in terms of a voltage, and then you have a threshold. When the voltage is hit the threshold, you can get fire, right? So this neuron actually is uh, equal to uh, uh, mathematically to this uh, differential equation, right? And uh, so when we have a pressure you now stimulating the sensor, the, and the sensor will generate the triboelectric voltage, and you can you now get uh, provide the current to this uh, artificial neuron, and then you can have a uh, you know, uh, accumulation of voltage when the voltage hits the threshold, and you get spike. And we can easily to uh, 
uh, just the amplitude of these uh, spikes and the rate, we can reduce the rate to, down to 200 hertz. This is an easy task when do this. Do this. So we use this uh, type of uh, artificial neuron for encoding, and then we can build up a, uh, you know, a sensor array and then use this uh, timing for information coding. And then we can use the artificial neural network on machine learning to do the uh, object classification. And then we find that uh, actually our system performed very well uh, for this object classification. The accuracy on average can reach to uh, 96%. This means our um, tactile, no, our skin with, uh, uh, with the, the Spike timing as the encoding actually contains uh, the the key information about the object when we do touching and the grasping, and at the same time we found that uh, if we use the spike timing to encode the tactile information, it's really robust to the variation you now uh, because our skin is somehow it's a pre premature. There's a lot of variation happening when we repeatedly uh, grasping objects. And also, it's very robust to to damage you now of the e skin. Okay, so this is the second demonstration we developed in our lab, and it shows that it's quite uh, advantages to to develop e skin by using the uh, by using this uh, neuromorphic approach. Okay, so in summary, basically, we have demonstrated. In, neural mimetic e-skins that are capable of coding dynamic tactile information and it's energy efficient, right? And it's able to discriminate the direction and speed of stimuli on the skin when we just take on, uh, just exploit the concept of a uh, receptive field of the of neurons, okay? And they can classify the object in shape and stiffness and uh, in one word, we believe that the neuromorphic engineering is a promising approach to re reproduce the human like same touch in the future. Okay, so this is the um, last slide I have about this uh, talk. Thank you for your attention. Uh, welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sang, for this very informative and detailed presentation on the possibilities of neuromorphic or neuro-inspired artificial skin, electronic skin. So if you have any questions, please, please uh, come forward and ask to Dr. Zhang. Right. So it seems like uh, there's no more question and I don't have anything either. So let's conclude today's meeting. To a seminar, and I would like to thank again our speakers, Dr. James Goodman and Dr. Zibin Zhang, for your inspiring presentation. Thank you very much on behalf of the whole Big Brothers team.